What's up, Doombots? Tony Skinjili here with a new series. This series is going to be Legendary Spotlights, where I'm going to take a Legendary in the order I think it makes the most sense people will unlock them, and kind of just talk about them. Think about what they need, their usability, their availability, how you get them, when they matter, when they don't, blah, 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 you'll see. But I do like to start, as with most, with availability. Now, Star-Lord is one of the most available characters in the game. Uh, as far as Legendaries con are concerned, uh, it's very easy to get him. It's almost as easy as it is to getting Iron Man, mainly because the team that you work on to unlock Star Wars, unlike many others, is actually the team you use Star Wars in. Most legendaries don't actually require that. They require some random team of characters. Uh, Star Wars is one of the very few that require you to use the team you're going to use that character with in order to unlock, with a couple of extras. And we'll take a quick look at them in one second. And one second has passed. So, this is it. This is the core number of characters. There are nine different characters you can use to unlock Star Wars. Uh, of them, most of these characters are available the day you start playing the game. I literally don't even mean within the first couple of days. Uh, you can farm Yondu, Ravager Bruiser, <laughs> Mantis, Gamora, and Ravager Boomer the day you start playing. Within a couple of days, you gain access to the ability to farm characters like Drax uh, and maybe a handful of Rocket Raccoon, depending on where you are in raids. Ultimately, the hardest character, the most difficult character to get to on this team is Groot. It usually takes Groot maybe a week before you can get to his node to be able to farm him. But every single character used to unlock Star Wars is available relatively early. Rocket is Raid Store, Drax is Arena, Yondu is a node farm, Groot is a node farm, Gamora and Mantis and Ravager Broomer are all available in the Blitz Store. Obviously the priority is not what I just said, it is Mantis being the best character, uh, Gamora being somewhat the second best farm, and Ravager Boomer being the oops, I might as well. And yes, I would target farm at least Mantis the entire time to make sure you have her at the level. I wouldn't worry about Blitz Orbs or anything like that. Ravager Bruiser is also a node farm and Ravager Stitcher, like Rocket, is in the raid store. So, if you are opening raid orbs, there's a chance you might be getting Rocket and Ravager Stitcher shards. Ultimately, there's about three characters you can farm on nodes, uh, one, maybe two different characters you can reliably farm in the stores. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say farming Ravager Bruiser is a great decision, but if your goal is to get Star Wars as quickly as possible, which I recommend, you might as well. It's not really going to hurt you too much. You don't have to put much investment in him, as you can kind of see by my roster, how little I cared about Ravager, actually the Ravagers at all, but they got where they needed to be. The fights for Star Wars are particularly easy. He is one of the first character legendaries you have the full access to farm from day one, so it kind of makes sense that you would start farming for that legendary. You'll always be about 90 days away from the next Star Wars event, uh, or the one that, where you can unlock him anyway. So, looking at the team and his availability, clearly he's one of the easiest ones, uh, and you don't necessarily need to have a five-star rocket ready by the time you unlock him. You just have to have a rocket present. Once you get to the star levels, that becomes stuff for later, and that's actually what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about usability. So, when we talk about usability, specifically for characters, uh, it's got to be different than when we talk about teams, because characters are way more flexible. When you have one character, you have to be able to look at them where not only on their team, but outside of their team. And that's where characters like Star Wars shine. Star Wars usability from the day you unlock him is, is pretty much astronomical. Uh, you can use him as part of either the Guardians or BKT in order to power through uh, the earliest stages of U5 and U6 raids. Or you can do what I'm doing on my current free-to-play account, which is using him to feed energy into Carnage, who uh, doesn't really have any other way. His kit overall gives him the usability you need in the early middle and late game not end game but late game of marvel strike force that you will almost never regret all of the value you put into him because you will get it back by using him in those game modes and i'll kind of go over his abilities in a second to talk about why uh, the other thing that people just kind of sleep on all the time is the ability of star wars to kind of trivialize dark dimension 2. 
Dark Dimension 2 is probably the first major milestone a player is going to accomplish because it's the first time that they have to deviate from the look at this one team I've been working on and move a little bit more towards how do I work on independent characters. And one team that I've been recommending for a very long time for any new player, whether you're willing to spend money or otherwise, because if you're willing to spend money, you might as well spend it intelligently uh, to go as far as you can, make your money stretch, is the core team of Star-Lord, Minerva, and Invisible Woman. With those three characters, the other two characters can literally be anyone else, and you will still have a very, very, very good time in Dark Dimension 2. Uh, in the concept of Star Wars feeds energy to Minerva, and Minerva is constantly doing percentage damage, where Invisible Woman, who will be probably the next character I do this for, uh, will give them enough sustain when you need it to make sure you can survive long enough to progress. Uh, and that, because it's a three-part team, the other two characters can literally be anybody, and they will just help you overall, since that's the core of what that team's going to be. Now, yes, anyone can use any team to beat anything in this game, and I completely understand that, and I think it's foolish to imagine that there's not a best answer to anything that's been around for over a year, and for my money, and what I've been at advocating is this three-piece set, Star Lord, Minerva, and Invisible Woman, is probably the cheapest that you can get into Dark Dimension 2 and clear it in between one and three days, uh, compared to any other investment you'd have to put into any other team ever, more or less. Uh, or money you'd have to spend in any other team from the other side of it. So we have the core of what the uh, character does on his team, which is he's a great raid character. Uh, we have the core of what the character does in uh, Dark Dimension 2, and of course you can use that team in Dark Dimension 1 as well. You know, If you have the six stars on them, they will totally be fine. I'm personally am skipping Dark Dimension 1, getting Ultron, and then going back to Dark Dimension 1 with Ultron, lol, that's going to be fun, because it is. And then we have the other game modes. You're going to have a Blitz team kind of built in. The Guardians will win anywhere you need to in Blitz. You're going to have a War team, either a War Offense or Defense. The Guardians can beat pretty much anybody, with the exception of specific meta teams, you know? And if you're early enough in the game when you unlock Star-Lord, you're not going to see many of those teams. You're not going to run into Black Order teams or Coulson Shield teams. It's very unlikely that people at your PCP or power level, based on your alliance, are going to have that. He's also going to help you in Arena. He's going to beat up everybody who has the Defenders. He's going to beat up everybody who has AIM. Because Star Lord and Rocket will kill Scientist Supreme on turn one. And then what does AIM do? Sit there and lose. You know, like you're... You're going to get the most value you can if the first thing you do of meaning in the game is unlock Star Wars, because you're going to get value now in Arena, in War, in Raids, things that you probably didn't have before. Then you're going to get value later in Dark Dimension 2 and maybe some of the situational raids. Once you get to the end game, and I truly mean the end game, once you're starting to figure out what the optimal team for Dark Dimension 3 is, and once you start figuring out how do I push harder in U7.4? That's when you're going to notice the start of the fall of, of Star Wars. He, he doesn't have the survivability. He doesn't have the damage. He's just a reliable energy battery. And because of that, he becomes a little bit more difficult to use in that end game. But you still end up with a character that can be used in every, and I do mean every, raid. From Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. He's an excellent cosmic raid character in the early. He'll actually help you do Gamma 4, or Alpha 4 rather, before you would normally have a better team, or as Guardians or something like that. Fantastic Four hybrid comms. But he's almost always an include in that cosmic team because he can either feed energy to the right character, or you could protect him meaningfully enough. Beta, Tech, no conversation. Just throw him on a team with Tech. You could throw him in Rocket. You could throw him in Shuri. You could throw him in anybody. If the tag says Tech, you can use Star Wars. Not feel bad about it. He's going to help your team win. He has extra synergy with characters like Hello, where he can blind and then Hello can spread it. Especially if you're feeding Hello, as long as Greg doesn't get in the way. There's a lot of value you have in the beta raids. Then you have the Gamma raids, in which there's teams that you require Wave 1 Avengers or Guardians at the beginning. At the end, it's like guardians or like wakandans or there's a whole bunch that you can always get this value so the idea is that even though this character is not 
a character you get up the day you get him and then use him every single day in all of the hardest content in the game. Uh, no game is ever like that, so I'm sorry if someone told you that this game was like that. But more importantly, you, he's never useless. He's never like the crossbones that you get in the first couple of days of the game, or the Electra, where you're just like, these characters aren't really helping. He always has value, so you'll never regret what you put into him. Except, of course, the Tier 4s, but we'll talk about that right now. When we talk about breakpoints on this character, it's important to note it's not for his team, it's about him. So you're going to see a big difference in uh, in those kind of conversations if you see my team reviews where I discuss this is a great tier 4 for this team versus when I say this is right now, this is a great tier 4 in general. So we're going to start with his passive improvisation. Used to be that this was, without a doubt, one of the best tier 4s you can get. Now it would be the first tier 4 I take back if they ever gave me the opportunity to. The reason why is I put it in him assuming it did something different. I assume that this guaranteed generate one to two ability energy uh, to adjacent allies. I didn't think it uh, just changed 50%. You know, it just changed this number. I, I, I assumed uh, it took it from 50% chance to generate one to two, one energy. I, I just assumed it brought it up to a guarantee. It didn't. So that's the first step. The second step is I cannot tell you the number of times that this happened on his turn and he generated one to two ability energy for the adjacent ally and the amount of times where that second energy made a difference as opposed to the first energy Do you know what i mean like i don't know if my if my character was exactly two energy away when this triggered and it gave two energy which allowed that character to use the ability which then let that ability matter i you know it's just so many does so many variables that where it used to be amazing because every little bit helped now it doesn't matter now that we can build characters stronger for the content that it used to be it's just totally unnecessary for this tier four but you know i have it and even to this day i still don't know if the difference between the one or two energy uh those characters are getting is really making a difference i just don't really notice it i kind of wish it was 100 percent because then i'd say absolutely but for now, I'm avoiding this stuff. I kind of wish I could take it back, but I needed it, or I thought I needed it at the time. The other thing is the Guardian's damage and speed. It just, this only matters for the Guardian's team, but man, does it matter for the Guardian's team. Elemental Blast. Uh, this is a tier four that gets a little bit better as you start pushing real endgame content because his damage falls off a little bit. Uh, but that said, doesn't actually matter for his kit. The biggest deal here is gain assist from a Guardian and uh, an additional random ally. If you have a second Guardian on the team, which for my money is always like Groot or something, you're guaranteed to assist. So this is a big damage attack. I don't necessarily believe the tier 4 is necessary, but if you're really pushing for hard stuff or you really like Star Wars, you might have to put it in here for his damage to be comparable to some of the other characters you're bringing in. Uh, Clever Distraction. This is another one that used to matter and now I'm not 100%. So it grants two ability energy to random adjacent allies, apply blind to primary target, and an additional random target. This ability is unavoidable. Uh, at tier four, there is a 50% chance to apply blind to a third random target. Here's the thing, Star Wars focus is terrible. So it's not a 50% chance to apply uh, blind to a third random target. It's basically a 50% chance for that random target to resist Star Wars blind. Uh, you'll see that happen quite a bit in a lot of fights so that might just be an issue of his kit being one of the first legendaries and he just kind of lost out a little bit i don't know but i do know that uh there's no world where i would put this investment in him uh there's no world where i would rely on a 50 percent chance blind to make my team stronger uh if it increased the number of energy he grants which is really the value of this ability uh, and that's why it has to be level six to guarantee two energy to a random adjacent ally means you can control how much energy you're giving out and on turns where he's the only guardian and he gives himself the energy from his passive he can possibly do this every other turn it happens more frequently than i you know you'd think uh, and then elemental gun uh, if you watch my free to play account you know that i accidentally fat fingered and upgraded this and i regret that so please do as i say not as i do uh, the damage, 50% damage, uh, sure, 
Again, if you're using this ability, it's because one of the other two is on cooldown. You could, but uh, I don't think it's going to make too much of a difference. I don't think Star Wars Basic is really the meat and potatoes of his kit, so I don't think there's much you have to do with, with that. Um, as for gear, uh, gear tier 13 Star Lord is, is pretty much the end where I would leave him. Now, pre-Dark Dimension 3, I was kind of planning on using Star Lord to feed Minerva or Maw in, in that setup. Then we saw Dark Dimension 3, and we realized that none of it matters, because Dark Dimension 3 is less about sustain and more about how many cores can you spend to accomplish a task. Uh, or how much money did you spend to get your characters to a point where you don't have to spend that many cores. So I'm going to hold off a little bit. Now some of these gear pieces you may see on him, these are actually completed gear pieces that don't require any mini uniques that I got way back from Dark Dimension 2. Uh, and then the same thing when I Dark Dimension 3 gear, I'm just kind of saving and not really doing much with it uh, until I need see what I need for Dark Dimension 4. There is a situation where I might need him for Dark Dimension 4, uh, but ultimately, I don't think you need to bring him past gear tier 13. I think that's where 100% of his value is realized. I think that's when you beat in Dark Dimension 2, and now you're just using him as a utility character. He did his job at the beginning, and now you move on to the next setup. Uh, I'm not going to give these characters ratings. I don't necessarily think that uh, there's any value to be putting a rating on Star Wars. But I will tell you that the earlier you get Star Wars, the better your game becomes as you progress. That's true of quite a bit of legendaries. Uh, Magneto kind of falls off later and a lot of people who skip characters like Star Wars and Magneto and eventually unlock them feel like maybe they got a little bit of a raw deal. A lot of that is because you didn't get the character when they were meant to help you. You got the character significantly later in the game when they became kind of less valuable. So the earlier you get Star Wars, the better impact he's going to have on your team and the more he's going to help carry you to whatever your next responsibility or goal is, which is making more war teams, making more uh, arena teams, making more raid teams, you know, get hot, scoring higher points in PvP. There's a lot of value you can see in, in certain characters and um, when you when you look at a kit like Star Wars, and most of the legendaries have very unique kits, when you look at those kits, you get to see this really fun interaction that you can have. Like, hey, I need this character to constantly be doing an ability. Well, if you put Star Wars next to them, they probably will be able to do that ability all the time. That kind of thing. Uh, a lot of theory crafting always involves with how much uh, can I get value out of Star Wars or which character. So. Overall, I would recommend Star Wars being the first legendary character you unlock under any circumstances because it's really just the easiest. It's the easiest character to get whether you're spending money or completely free to play. He's the easiest legendary to start target farming on day one and make sure you have enough characters to unlock him whenever he comes out. If you're willing to spend, then there's a wonderful bundle for $24.99 that gives you a huge jump start on this character. Uh, and of course there will be offers throughout time, usually cheaper than anything else, uh, and most of the characters that you use to unlock Star Wars are actually offers that you can find when you go to farm the character in the node. So all in all, my money on Star Wars, one of the best legendaries you can get in the early game, will help you in the early, middle, and late game, and he will never be completely useless, you will always have value in Star Wars. That's pretty much it for this legendary spotlight. Have a good night, have a great day, and comment below and let me know how Star Wars has affected your roster. Where you are, when you got him, what you were able to do that you previously weren't, or whether he had no impact. Either way, I've been Tony Scangilli, and I'll catch you later.